At the outbreak of World War I in August of 1914, Lord Kitchener, who was the British Secretary of State for War, believed very early on that overwhelming manpower would be the key to winning the war. So he began to look for ways to encourage men of all classes to join the British Army. Now this was a concept that flew in the face of centuries of British military tradition in which the British Army had always relied on a very small but professional group of soldiers. And they had always drawn the members uh, of their officer class from the gentry and the lower classes were where they got most of their enlisted men. But it was General Sir Henry Rawlinson who would go on to command the army here at the Somme, who suggested that men would be more inclined to enlist in the army if they knew that they were going to serve alongside their friends, family, and co-workers. And so he appealed to London stockbrokers to raise a battalion of men from the workers in the city of London to set an example. 1,600 men enlisted in what became the 10th Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers, the so-called Stockbrokers Battalion, within a week in late August of 1914. A few days later, the Earl of Derby decided to raise a battalion very similar to that out of men from Liverpool. Within two days, 1,500 men had joined this new battalion. Speaking to these men, Lord Darby said, quote, This should be a battalion of pals, a battalion in which friends from the same office will fight shoulder to shoulder for the honor of Britain and for the credit of Liverpool. End quote. Within the next few days, three more battalions were raised in Liverpool. And so these four battalions formed the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th battalions of the King's Regiment. Encouraged by Lord Darby's success, Lord Kitchener promoted the idea of organizing similar recruitment drives all throughout Britain. By the end of September of 1914, more than 50 towns had formed PALS battalions. The larger towns and cities were able to form several battalions each. So for example, Manchester, they were able to raise four battalions in August and four more a few months later. From the perspective of the war office, these PAL battalions were just an incredible experiment because they relieved the heavy strain not only on recruiting uh, a suddenly much more expanded regular army, but they also relieved the financial strain because they decided in September of 1914 uh, that the organizers of these battalions would be responsible for meeting the initial costs of their accommodation and other uh, training costs until the war office would take over. And that worked out really well for the war office, but also for the men, because uh, this meant that many of these new recruits in these PALS battalions were initially able to live at home. They would go to training during the day in their local community with the other men, and then they would come home after a day of basic training. The Accrington Pals are probably the best remembered of the battalions that were raised in the early months of the First World War in response to Kitchener's call for a volunteer army. Groups of friends from all walks of life in Accrington and its neighboring towns enlisted together to form their own battalion with a distinctively local identity. A month after the outbreak of the war, the Accrington Observer and Times newspaper of September 8, 1914, reported that the War Office had accepted an offer made by the mayor of Accrington, Captain John Harwood, to raise a complete battalion. When recruitment began on the 14th of September, 104 men were accepted in the first three hours. Brothers, cousins, friends, workmates enlisted together, and within 10 days, the Accrington Battalion had all but reached a full strength of 1,100 men. 
Now around half the battalion had been recruited from Accrington. The majority of the remainder had been raised in neighboring towns such as Burnley, Chorley, and Blackburn. But they all came from basically the same area. Throughout the early months of the battalion's existence, the men trained and drilled in and around their hometowns, like most of the PALS battalions did. In February of 1915, they were given this magnificent send-off as they left Accrington for training at Carnarvon, where Lieutenant Colonel A.W. Rickman of the Northumberland Fusiliers took command of the battalion. In May of 1915, the battalion moved from Carnarvon to Penkridge Bank Camp near Rugley, outside of Birmingham, where it joined the 12th, 13th, and 14th battalions of the York and Lancaster regiments to form the 94th Brigade of the 31st Division. The battalion made further moves in July and then in September of 1915 before they embarked in December for Egypt, of all places, to counter a Turkish threat against the Suez Canal. That danger soon passed, and in the last week of February of 1916, the 31st Division was ordered to France to take part in the preparations for the joint British and French attack that was to come here at the Somme. The objective of the PALS battalions of the 94th Brigade was to capture the hilltop fortress of Serre and form a defensive flank facing northeast and north. They were the northernmost point on the attack at the Somme on July 1st. That attack was to be led by the 11th East Lancashires on the right and the 12th York and Lancasters, the Sheffield City Battalion, on the left. The 1st and 2nd Barnsley PALS, the 13th and 14th York and Lancasters, were in support, in reserve, uh, for those leading battalions. Facing them in Serre was the 169th Infantry Regiment of the German Army, the 8th Baden Infantry. On the 24th of June, as was true all the way along the line, the British artillery opened a bombardment that was to continue until the very morning of the attack. This bombardment was intended to destroy the German defenses, but also open holes in the barbed wire uh, and allow for easy access to uh, the strong points. But it failed to penetrate through to many of the underground shelters and it left much of the barbed wire intact. In the early evening of the 30th of June, the 11th East Lancashires left their camp at Warnemont Wood for a seven mile journey to the trenches here in front of Serre. The lead elements didn't even arrive on the front until 2.40 a.m. on the morning of Saturday, July 1st, just a few hours before the attack was meant to commence. These areas were already heavily shell damaged. The buildup had not gone, gone unnoticed by the Germans. And as daylight broke, the forward lines were getting pounded by German artillery. The woods behind me today are known as Sheffield Memorial Park, and it's a, a place in honor of the members of the PALS battalions who attacked here on the morning of July 1st of 1916. But at the time, they were actually four distinct tiny copses of trees, and you can see how it runs all the way down. They've merged together, the trees have grown since then, and they were known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm standing in front of Mark right now. And if we turn around, just on the other side of that cemetery would have been the German lines. It was only about 300 yards. And so you could think, okay, you know, 300 yards, we could do that. We can cross that amount of territory. Beyond that, 
uh, right where the woods are is where the village of Serre is actually uh, located. But it wasn't as easy as it looked, as the men found out very quickly. So here's a map that, that gives you a really good sense of things. We are right here uh, on the edge. This is about where the Accrington Palace Monument is. We are right on the edge uh, of the attack line. This is the 11th Battalion East Lancashire Regiment. That's the Accrington Palace. Uh, and then you can see the other the other PALS units. And they had moved up uh, over time to where we are now. And then you can see the German lines. There was a machine gun right there. There's other ones here, here, here. And then you can see where they advanced throughout the day. There were four trench lines and then fortifications actually inside the town of Serre itself. Just a brutal place to attack. At around 6.30 in the morning, the British artillery began its final bombardment of the German front lines. As shells continued to burst on the German front trench, the men of the 3rd and 4th companies of the German 169th Infantry scrambled from underground shells, bringing up their machine guns, their rifles, and their grenades, ready to put them onto the, fire, the attacking troops. At 7.30 a.m., the bombardment was lifted from the German front lines and the leading waves of the POWs battalions rose up and began to walk toward the German positions. They were convinced that the front lines had been eliminated and so there was really no threat and so they walked. But they found out almost immediately in that 300 yards of deadly space that the Germans were very much active and they tore huge holes in the advancing lines of infantry. One British observer likened the lines of dead to, quote, swaths of cut corn at harvest time. Now, as credible, incredible as it seems, groups of pals defied the machine gun fire. They threaded their way through the barbed wire and they dropped into the German front line trenches. On their left, some of the 12th York and Lancasters also fought their way through. But it was all in vain. Behind them, the third and fourth waves also suffered horrifying losses before they even reached no man's land because of the German artillery. The leading companies of the 13th York and Lancasters were cut down. Some of the pals, their officers having been killed or wounded, pressed on toward the town of Serre, and they were never seen again. The remaining survivors in the German front line, having received no reinforcements, were forced to withdraw. By 8 a.m., just 30 minutes into the fight, the battle for Serre was effectively over. The history of the East Lancashire Regiment in the Great War records that out of 720 Accrington Pals who took part in that attack, in just the span of a half hour, 584 were killed, wounded, or missing. Brigadier General H.C. Reese of the 94th Brigade said, quote, the result of the high explosive shells, the shrapnel, the machine gun fire, and the rifle fire was such that hardly any of our men even reached the German front trench. The lines which advanced in such admirable order melted away under fire, yet not a man wavered. Not a man broke the ranks or attempted to go back. I have never seen, indeed could never have imagined such a magnificent display of gallantry, discipline, and determination. Now back home in England, the initial accounts of success on the Somme, including an erroneous report of the capture of the town of Serre, soon gave way to newspaper pages filled with photographs of the killed, wounded, and missing. Few, if any, of the town's population could have been untouched by the tragedy. 
Percy Holmes, who was the brother of one of the original members of the POWs, recalled, quote, I remember when the news came through to Accrington that the POWs had been wiped out. I don't think there was a street in Accrington that didn't have their blinds drawn. And the bell at Christ Church tolled all the day. Sergeant John William Streets, who was one of the pals. He was in the 12th Battalion, York and Lancaster, the Sheffield Pals. He was also a poet. He wrote these words. Behind that long and lonely trenched line to which men come and go, where brave men die, there is a yet unmarked and unknown shrine, a broken plot, a soldier's cemetery. Sergeant Streets was killed in the attack on Sarah on the morning of July 1st. His body lay in no man's land, as thousands of others did, for almost 10 months before he was eventually recovered and he was believed to have been buried here at the Euston Road Cemetery. He was 31 years old. This is a memorial to him. Around the time his body was recovered, a collection of poems that he wrote was posthumously published under the title the undying splendor. And this is what he wrote. Reach out thy hands, thy spirit's hands to me, and pluck the youth, the magic from my heart, magic of dreams whose sensibility is plumed like the light, visions that start, mad pressure in the blood, desire that thrills, the soul with mad delight to yearning wed, all slothfulness of life draw from its bed, the soul of dawn across the twilight hills. Reach out thy hands, O spirit, till I feel that I am fully thine. For I shall live in the proud consciousness that thou dost give. And if thy twilight fingers round me steal and draw me unto death, thy votary am I, O life. Reach out thy hands to me. Thank you.